yesterday i read something don't let anyone ruin your day especially when you can do a good job ruining it yourself <laughs> it explodes which is nothing but the thinking mind which is churning all the time can you imagine if today is your last day on the planet and your mind is just churning stuff about what people said and what people did and what you did and what you said but we assume we'll be there tomorrow it's an assumption so we afford ourselves the luxury of being lost in our drama which is most unfortunate life is precious and most of us are addicted to our psychological suffering it takes courage to even accept that if we find that the same patterns are going on in our mind let's say it's to do with a specific person in our life the troublemaker and we find we are getting lost in the same story again and again and again that means we are addicted to our suffering isn't it an addiction this person is troubling me now we know who we are i am the one being troubled by this person that is my identity now i am comfortable it's absolutely crazy i mean it's just quite mind boggling that we give ourselves this luxury of complaining about people and how they are with us and wanting to change them into how they should be with us how they should behave with us the sage has let go of this need the sage accepts everyone precisely the way god created them the sage rests in the knowing that god knows best god does not need me to tell people how they should or should not behave you see this whole philosophy of advaita i never understood this word when my teacher spoke about it he was talking about peace of mind then people would say it falls under the category of advaita it was too big a word for me it already sounded like scriptures and lectures and all that stuff when i realized that its meaning at its core is a dwait not to not to i was fascinated by this what does this mean not to it doesn't mean one 
otherwise it would say one it means not two it is pointing to not two and my teacher said it very simply this whole not two business was very simply explained that you feel you are listening and I am speaking. Right now everyone feels that. But the fact is, consciousness is listening through one body-mind and speaking through the other. Which basically means, if we both were dead, it would not happen. We are alive, we are conscious. So while it appears to be two, while it appears that one person is listening and one person is speaking, it is consciousness that is listening through one and speaking through the other. I found that very simple. And to make it even simpler, he would give the example of electricity. We are all so comfortable in the knowledge that the same electricity functions through all the gadgets in the kitchen. We don't question it. We know that the toaster will produce toast when it's switched on, the microwave will heat the food. But the electricity running through them is the same. And each gadget is designed a certain way. The toaster is designed to produce toast, so we don't have an expectation that the toaster is going to heat the food, like the microwave. That expectation is not there, because we know it is designed a certain way for a certain output. But we lose this understanding when it comes to our interactions with people. We want them to be other than the way God has designed them. That is where the trouble starts. So when I lose sight of this fact, then my life is only two. And that only two is me versus the other all the time. If I am trying to win an argument with my spouse, me versus the other. If I am trying to prove my point to my boss, me versus the other. If I am trying to prove my opinion is more worthy than my friend's opinion about a particular restaurant or movie, me versus the other. And this teaching says that this me versus the other, when it is healed back through this vision to me and the other, whoever it may be, then the result is peace of mind in daily living. That is all. Nothing more than that. When I can allow people to express themselves and be the way God made them, then I am not honoring that person, I am honoring God. When I see that the hand of God moves everyone in my life, whoever I meet morning to night, I step out of the house, I meet my watchman. I see a beggar on the road begging. Go to the office, colleagues, whoever it may be. When I start seeing that everyone I encounter, those who make me happy and those who make me sad, all of them, bar none, are guided by the same energy, the same source. And everyone in life is playing out their own blueprint. 
like me when i live this way i find i am more and more at peace i say what has to be said i express myself if the need arises and i let it go that's it i don't try to force my opinion on someone i don't try to convince them i am right you are wrong that need has gone the train has left that station because i know now that whatever happens is the will of god i know now life means duality of every conceivable kind that's the structure of everyone's life up and down left and right front and back black and white rich and poor but the two most important polarities one i mentioned me and the other and the other pleasure and pain when i accept life is not going to give me pleasure all the time my own experience of life is sometimes pleasure sometimes pain in fact many people have the experience many times pain and only few times pleasure when i accept this is the basic design of life one big shift happens when there is pleasure i enjoy it but deep down i know this too shall pass and when there is pain in my life i know it could only happen if it was the will of god and i pray to that same god to give me strength to deal with it and i know this too shall pass you see if one's own life is transient then it is understood that everything within that life is also transient whereas we are seeking permanency in life it is again quite absurd when you look at it you know you are going to pass away in that sense the body is not going to be there forever but we act as if the goings on in our life are permanent so life is about relationships there are three kinds of relationships one is with others two is with one self and the third is one's relationship with what happens in life relationship when this is understood the result is peace and harmony in daily living nothing else you find yourself being more and more comfortable with your own life the people in your life and with what happens in your life you may not like it something may happen i may get some bad news doesn't mean i have to like it but i accept it that's the first movement of acceptance usually we push back we reject the happening without realizing it's already too late because it's happened now that it has happened how do i deal with it so the sage is not pushing away happenings in life he has accepted it it came unasked this news came unasked a loss in business a friend passed away we don't know it came unasked the first thing is a total acceptance of what is 
Thereafter, I do that which I think and feel I should do. Simple. So, in my relationship with what happens, if I have the total acceptance of what is, I accept the will of God. Then I decide, do I make my move or not? In my relationship with people, I accept that whenever I see a flaw in someone, whenever I feel I am criticizing someone, the realization comes, I must be having my own flaws. Then the next realization comes, is it really a flaw? Is it really a flaw? I don't know this person I met today, what happened in their childhood, what experiences God gave them, how their parents' relationship was with the child, the economic background, the social background. I have no idea. I have seen you for the first time. And I am passing judgment. And I am criticizing without knowing the whole backstory. And so I feel you have a flaw. But is it a flaw if God designed and programmed each individual? Is it really a flaw? For example, if I call someone a miser, he doesn't like to spend money, he is sitting on so much money. I don't know what his childhood experience was. It may have been an experience of lack. His conditioning may have forced him to become a miser. I have no idea. But I pass a judgment. He doesn't put his hand in his pocket. The judgment is already passed. But when I realize that I am really nobody to come to this conclusion, because I don't know, I realize this person is the way God has made this person. The thought may arise. I wish this person was more open with their money. And it's gone. I don't carry that, you see. We drag these burdens of opinions and judgments behind us. Dead weight. And we are carrying enormous dead weight from the time we were born. How long are we going to carry it till we ourselves are dead? The dead past is dead weight. The only thing is, when we are five years old, our past is five years old. More future is ahead of us. When we are 15, our past is 15 years of weight, less future ahead. But we play out the old script. Then we are 50 years old, we are carrying 50 years of dead past. Now, the future has shrunk. Time is ticking by. And this teaching says, let go. Because the story of your past has become immense now. And you are living in it. You are addicted to your past. You are addicted to your suffering in the past. And every time you repeat it, you are perpetuating it. This happened to me. Absolutely crazy. Now imagine someone you've known all your life is standing in front of you. And someone who has never met this person is standing beside you looking at the same person. This person has no idea what filters you are seeing the person with. 
you are seeing the person from the beginning of your time how this sibling behaved with me he or she did this did that parent behaved with me that is all in your that data is stored in your mind the stranger next to me does not see all that he is open to this person because he has no context and may have a very good time meeting this person whereas you are suffering your relationship inside which basically means our suffering is because of our own conditioning and exposure which created our filters through which we see this person so who is suffering i am actually suffering my own filters it's quite strange <coughs> this is the maya that is why siddharameshwar maharaj said maya is me that's it no need to go beyond that maya is me and my story that is the maya and because the sage is no longer thinking in the old way of blame condemnation malice jealousy envy none of that is operating in the mind of the sage the sage is like an open void anyone who comes in the presence of the sage feels they are not judged that is why they are comfortable they don't feel judged at all they don't feel the need to wear a mask whereas we are always wearing masks we want to be liked we want to be liked we want to win votes and most importantly we don't want to die and this teaching says it is all about death to know about life you have to know about death if something is taken away from you let's say there's an object in your house which you cherish you spent a lot of money on it it is lying there on your shelf and you love seeing it it could be a curio it could be anything and the maid knocks it down and it breaks 
it is a death. For you, it is a death. Something has died. More importantly, that thing which I saw and valued so much is gone from my consciousness now. So I feel the loss. I feel the loss. I am the one who is dying to it. It's very important to understand this. Let's say I have a job and I lose the job. So the job which was there in my life, in my consciousness has gone. It's a death. Now, how am I identified with this job? Was I very proud? Oh, I was the chief financial officer of this organization. This is me. People would respect me when I walked into the office. Now I am dead to that because it's gone. It has, this death has been forced upon me. But the sage knows. God has gifted me this job. God gifted me attributes which made me a success at this job. Someone else may not have had that success. I happen to have it. Circumstances were in my favor. But during the course of the job, the sage has the humility to know it is not my doing. While the sage has the job, the sage knows I am a success because it is God's will. I am an instrument through whom this job has happened successfully. So when tomorrow the job goes, Pain may arise for the sage, job has gone, but no suffering. The sage knows, God gifted me this job, I had a good run, God has taken it away. I did my best. So because of the understanding of the sage and the humility of the sage, because the sage is not so identified with it as my job, this is who I am. He finds it easy to let go. No suffering. Whereas we suffer. We get lost in the loss of the job. I was there. Now look where I am. That is the ego with its sense of doership. For the sage that is finished. The sage has stepped out of this game of doership and living on the pairs of opposites. We are always choosing one side. And because we do that, we swing like a pendulum, like this. Morning to evening, our life is like this pendulum which is going from one polarity to the other throughout the day. And the sage has risen above the pairs of opposites. That is why he is quite unmoved by the happenings of life. He has seen. This game of life. Happiness cannot be found when I am polarized. It is the Buddha's middle path. Which is a path of not being polarized. That is where happiness is to be found. When I don't get swayed anymore, like I used to be swayed. When I can 
be resting in my being, my pure essence. And witnessing the movie of life while it happens. The problem is we run away with the story. We have no problem going to the cinema and watching a movie for three hours. All the ups and downs of the hero, the villain, all the characters playing out their roles. We are witnessing the movie. And the sage is witnessing the movie of his own life. That is the difference. Whereas we got lost in the movie of our own life, thinking that we are the director, we are the scriptwriter, we are the actors. And then we have assumed, eaten up this whole movie without realizing that there is the hand of God which is operating from above, moving each piece on the chessboard of life precisely the way that hand wants it to move. It really has nothing to do with you. If this understanding comes when you are faced with someone whom you've had a history of troubles with, then you will know the gift of this understanding. If there is someone in your life you feel you cannot forgive for the way they behaved with you, and you see them in the light of this understanding that they played their role the way God made their role. I just happened to be at the receiving end. It takes courage. My teacher would say, this is called living the life courageous. Otherwise, you'll be keeping on pointing fingers and blaming people all the time. But all that is going on in your own consciousness only. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the other. The story is in your own mind. The villain is in your own mind. So when you see this one person in your life who you really know is accountable for taking away your peace, and you re-look at this person and see the hand of God behind it all. Then you find you start responding rather than reacting to this person. Otherwise, button is pushed and you react, pushed and you react. Now, there is an understanding which brings in a gap. And you may just find yourself saying, my God, this person cannot help say what they are saying or cannot help do what they are doing. It's a revelation. Because now, it is no longer they are doing it to me. That dialogue is gone. So I see them now in an objective light. And I, I can not only marvel that how this person is just 
or like a robot i can see that and what may happen will be quite surprising compassion may arise for this person usually the ones who trouble you and trouble many people are the most troubled any therapist will tell you that now you see that that if this person is saying such nasty things and such mean things what this person must have faced in their life they must also be suffering no for that to come out so you start seeing them with compassion earlier they were the adversary it was me versus them now i i understand that my god i really wish that this person sees the light the whole dynamic changes if i find myself behaving a certain way i have to be more gentle on myself normally we are full of guilt and shame people who know this make us feel more guilty they know how to manipulate us but when i realize okay i said something i didn't mean to it is my baggage of conditioning the way i felt mistreated as a child or if i felt i had low self worth whatever it may be but now i see it was not my doing god made me this way if there are two siblings one is aggressive one is passive who decided that god did so when i see in my own self lot of qualities which i don't like i can really be gentle on myself that i had no control over my conditioning how my parents were how the maid was in the house if there was a maid whatever it be siblings as a result of which i say certain things and behave a certain way so i will try my best next time but i accept that this is what was meant to happen through me also so my relationship with myself gets redefined and then this need many people feel that oh i wish i was a type a personality when you're not i wish i was the go getter i wish i was successful like so and so but you're not you're not designed that way so please don't try to take over god's script and just because you are impressed by how someone is you feel even you should strive to be that till a point yes but is it your nature b while you're striving are you creating suffering for yourself and for others or is it coming naturally and this becomes the constant dialogue during the day any action of mine i review it maybe at the end of the day if need be if i'm having an active lifestyle and i ask myself did i enhance someone's suffering in the course of the day including my own and i reflect on that where is my peace to be found not only i am i not peaceful but because i am not peaceful i want to snatch other people's peace away they have no right to be at peace because i am not at peace that is what the ego does i am unhappy so i must make you unhappy <laughs> we do it you have no right to be happy
and the sage. When we say the sage has died already while he is alive, what does it mean? It simply means he goes with the flow. So he is an ordinary guy, goes, watches a movie, whichever it may be. And someone asks him, did you like it? He said, oh, I loved it. And someone else at the table says, I hated it. The sage is not interested in convincing the other person of what a great movie it is. The sage may express himself, oh, you didn't like it? What a pity, I loved it. That's it. I have seen, I've used this example, I've seen it with my friends. When there are two divergent views on a movie, one will tell the other, you have no taste. <laughs> and then the whole Mahabharat will begin. Invariably happens. But when I accept, I liked it. Oh, you didn't like it. Okay. That's it. There's no room now for any drama and dialogue. Because you have accepted the duality of life. Same with restaurants. You try it. You, <laughs> if you know your friend likes a particular restaurant, one day just tell him, oh, I had, it's a terrible restaurant and see the reaction. Because we are prone to react. Are, isko kya malum khane ke mein? It's very easy to push people's buttons. And some people are addicted to that. Like the child is. You see, the child, when it starts putting its finger in the socket, because that is the birth of the ego, you see, I will extract a reaction from the parent. The parent will come running and say, don't do it. Do a ship. If I do this, there will be a reaction. The birth of doership takes place at the age of one and a half to two years. When the child conscious realizes, if I cry, my mother will come running. If I do something, something will happen. And that becomes the default setting. And this ego now starts getting hardwired and encrusted through Childhood, teenage years, and by the 20s, it has become this whole logjam of conditioning through which I view life. But the child, before the conditioning, before the ego kicked in, was pure being. A child is not going to judge an adult it sees. It's open to any two people which come before it. There's no judgment operating. That is the child consciousness. The Baal Krishna, that is why Gopala is worshipped. That is pure. And the sage has healed back to that consciousness. The sage has healed back to that way of being with people. I saw some series on the streaming platform, I forget which one, where one prince is being trained. Great qualities the prince has, righteousness, great warrior, everything. And his friends are in trouble. And he wants to rush to their help. And so the priestess asks him, that, look, you have to do something. I know your friends are in trouble. Just hold on. He said, no, no, my friends are in trouble. I will rush. I will give my life for them. And the priestess said, hold on. This is not the makings of a great king. The great king will respond no matter who is in trouble, not just friends. Please remember that and then go to save your friends. 
will you respond to those you are not fond of if they are in trouble? Or have you drawn your boundaries? These people I like, these people I don't like. Where is the question of that? If you had the full understanding that the same consciousness, consciousness is behind everyone, would you be able to differentiate? But we have created a hierarchy. Those closest to us, those somewhere in between and those furthest from us. Because the ego feels that these people who love me, wow, they enhance my sense of self. What about those people? Just because they don't enhance your sense of self, they are rejected. That is why Joel Goldsmith would say, it's too easy to pray for your family and friends. We all can do that. Try praying for your enemies. Then you will know where you stand. Try praying for the ones you had problem with in your life, the perpetrators. Just try it. He has said that. Because if you can do that, then you will know that your relationship is no longer with individuals, your relationship is with God. That is why when the Lord came to Pralada and said, I'll grant you a boon, he said, I don't want any boons, just your darshan is enough. No, no, I insist. I will grant you a boon, anything. And he thinks and thinks hard and he says, all right, I want that no harm should come to those who have tortured me. The Lord was shocked. What kind of a boon are you asking for? They have really tortured you and troubled you. He said, no, I'm clear. This is the boon I want. No harm should come to those who have tortured me. So the Lord said, why? He said, because if I wished harm upon them, then it means I wished harm upon you because you created them. And you will find your mind becomes more and more quieter, quieter and quieter and quieter. You will probably feel now the need to speak less when this understanding comes, because you know it's quite worthless my speech in any case. In fact, you say something and a whole new stream of karma begins. You get wrapped in this action-reaction loop, you see, especially when you are arguing with people. And that doership creates something else. And you just say, oh my God, if I had kept quiet, none of that would have happened. And this quietness starts becoming the default setting. And when we become quiet, internally quiet, we find that people are drawn to us. 
people like being with us. It is natural. If one has a degree of shanti, you just have to sit and be yourself. And you will find that there are people who like that and who like to be with you. They are not coming to you for your projection anymore. Otherwise, I'm projecting all the time. Wearing a fancy shirt, fancy watch, this, that. And now I say, this is who I am. Now there's no projection. So a shift happens. You may find your friendships start changing. Old friendships were operating on social structures and conditioning, friends of the past, which you may not have much in common with anymore. Whereas a stranger comes to you and you're more comfortable with the stranger and the stranger is comfortable with you. These things start happening which is very scary for the ego because the ego is familiar with past friendships, past relationships. It's the comfort zone. Now I find I'm comfortable with anyone, little past or no past or big past. Because I'm resting in being which was a natural God-given quality. Now, because my thinking mind is quietened down, I'm resting in that original essence. I've done enough now. And I find That in deep sleep, which is the complete absence of the me and my story, I find just like that, my waking state is becoming like that. The peace of deep sleep. Everyone wakes up and says, I slept well, but you were not there. So who slept well? Yet you know you slept well, but you were absent. This is everyone's experience. I was absent in my deep sleep and that's why I slept well, because if I was present, I would not have deep sleep. If your mind is churning all the time, you're not going to sleep well. I had this experience in the early days. I would meet some friends for dinner and I could not sleep at night. And I was wondering that was I troubled about what they said or was something on my mind? I could not get this answer. But then I realized that if someone I meet before sleeping has a very active mind, it was churning my mind. See, we are all vibrations. Like attracts like. A vibration of peace will attract peace. And a vibration of peace will also attract a troubled mind because it knows its nature is peace. But if I go with a troubled mind somewhere, I can rest assured I'm creating trouble everywhere. <laughs> it is not my doing, but it's happening because that vibration is being carried. It's a very tricky thing, you see, if someone is, let's say, a meditation teacher, it is imperative that their mind is stilled. Because if it is not, their troubled mind will seep into the other minds. So at the end of the day, we are all vibrations. We are vibrating at a certain frequency. If we are full of hatred, malice, ill will, spite, arrogance, and all these qualities, that is the frequency we are emitting. It is a grave injustice to others if you are meeting people socially and you are carrying all that within yourself. 
because you are lost in that. You are not being present for the person who is in front of you. But when I am simply being, whoever comes in front of me, I honor that. I'm available, I'm listening. Normally, we are very quick to reply without giving the other person time to finish themselves. We interrupt because we already know what we want to say. We are not listening. If one truly listen to someone, you will know where they are coming from because you are no longer listening at words. You are sensing a vibration, you are sensing a feeling in their voice and more importantly, you are sensing what is behind what they are saying. Even they don't know because they are operating on hardwired conditioning but the sage knows. The sage can see, I know where this person is coming from. Because the sage is not stuck at the level of the words. Now that can only happen if one is oneself still. And this quality of stillness, one can reap rich rewards with it. Then one finds that whatever life sends my way, that consciousness will face it. Whatever it be. Because now I am resting more and more in being. Earlier, throughout the day, I was buffeted around. Morning this happened, afternoon that happened, run here, do that, this, that. Now, I have developed this quality by the grace of God of witnessing of resting in being. And as Ramana Maharshi said, I reach that stage where I see, let what comes, come. Let what goes, go. And see what remains. I don't force people to love me anymore. You know, we have this contract we've written out with people that you must love me. What about giving love? That is why Maharaj said, I am not concerned with receiving love, but only giving it because that is my nature. And my teacher did not like the word love at all because it was always spoken about as the opposite of hate, the polaric opposite. So he was not impressed by anyone who would come and talk about love. He avoided it. And he would say, all I ask of you is don't hate anyone. So people would say, how silly is this? Don't hate. I don't hate anyone. Is it? Can you really say with full confidence you don't hate anyone? And all I'm asking of you is not to hate anyone. Why? Why this negative way? Because if you truly understood that consciousness is all there is, then two things happen. Consciousness cannot hate consciousness. Electricity cannot hate electricity. And secondly, 
the nature of consciousness itself is love. It doesn't have to do or say things to project that love. If you really had this understanding that all this is a show, there is nothing you would not love about it. But we are used to this dualistic love. This love which we want to even hear about people say, we want people to say, I love you, give us expensive gifts so we know now how much they love. By the value of the gift, I know now how much you love me. That's what we do. <laughs> we have already created all these compartments. And can there be a greater love if you have one friend who just sits with you and allows you to say what you want, be how you are, do what you want and just sits there quietly and wishes you goodbye. Isn't that true love? I'm sure everyone has such a person, but we overlook them. We lose them because the maya is so strong. The maya is of attraction. That one quiet person is there in our life, who's always been there. But because quietness is not noticeable, it gets overlooked. But I can assure you, when that person leaves your life, then the vacuum you feel, you will know at that time, how valuable that person was, then you will know. That is how life is. If we read a book, we read a page, our eyes are going to the words, but that blank space is what allows the words to be, but we ignore the blank space. That is the Maya. We are always attracted to things. Whereas now what happens is that whole show is exposed on the screen. Nothing is missed. I now know that everyone I meet in life, I am meeting on the screen of my own consciousness. There is nothing apart from it. You sitting in front of me or the sun in the sky. I may say, oh, the sun is thousands and hundreds of thousands miles away, you're three feet away. But both are appearing in my own consciousness. There's nothing apart from it. I am appearing in your consciousness. That is how close we are. And so is the person you don't like. That is how close you are. That is going on in your own consciousness. All your thoughts about this person are churning within yourself only. But it appears it's outside of you. And then someone comes along and says, hey, look here. Just be aware of what's going on in your own mind. That's all. Just be aware of it. I'm not saying do anything about it, but just be aware. That is called the start of the inward journey. When I realize everything is within me, that is the start of the journey within. So far, all without. What I see, hear, taste, smell, touch, outside, outside, outside. 
now it starts flipping back. That is why it is called the journey home. And then we become more mindful of the words we speak. What is behind them? Because words have weight. Words actually have weight. In ancient times, or even today, I have met yogis who chant a mantra and drop a wall. It's a vibration. Drop a wall. Words have weight. So the words we speak in unawareness, the things we say to people, once released, we can't take them back. There's no scope anymore. It's set out for whatever is to be done with them. So we become more mindful of this. That are words full of getting back at people? Are they full of you hurt me so I'm going to hurt you? What is behind these words? There are four stages of sound. Para, Pashanti, Madhima, Vekhari. In simple terms, everything emerges from the silence. Thoughts come, words are created and then they are released. But it happens in a split second. The sage is residing in the source. For us, our filters start coming in between. That is why Ramana Maharshi said that if you think words are powerful, how much more powerful would the silence be which is where they come from? This gets overlooked. If words are powerful, 
how much more powerful would the silence be which is where they emerge from but our focus is on the words Do you know for those who chant mantras, they know that the mantra is more effective when it is chanted internally, not externally. Because the tongue burns the mantra as you speak it. And the internal mantra becomes the ajapaja. If I am reciting a mantra continuously, let's say Som Namah Shivaya as an example, I will reach a stage where it starts on its own. That is the Sufi way also. My Sufi master, mentor, said when his guru died, after death, after he took his last breath, he put his ear on his chest. And he could hear Allah, Allah, Allah. He could hear it. So all the words we speak, that vibration is inside us, in our body-mind. If you find you're using a lot of extremes, you know, they reveal to you that you're probably sitting on the extremities, the superlatives. Worst movie I saw, worst. Oh, it wasn't a nice movie, I didn't enjoy it. The words will reveal to yourself where you stand. I mean, don't take it literally. Sometimes one can say something and one doesn't mean it in that sense, but it's just a pointer. Even this is foolishness. One has to talk so much just to point at the silence. Same thing. No? But because we are so <laughs> stuck in our ways and our grooves and our conditioning that one has to keep blurting it out. That's what my teacher was asked. Every day, post-retirement, he gave satsang. Every day, you're saying the same thing and same thing and same thing. He says there are two ways to look at it. One, is that the conditioning is so hardwired that there, it takes constant hammering to break it. That's why people come every day. They know what I'm going to say, but they come from all over the world every day because that constant hammering is required. Now, once that crust is broken, they still come every day. Now, why do they come every day? Because then he says, it becomes like your favorite song. You never get tired of listening to it. I was never one for being expressive. I was not a man of many words, especially when I was young, I was very timid and shy and I would want to be like the talkative friends in the group because you looked up to them. You felt something was wrong with you because they would also say, why are you quiet? I would sit in the breaks by the window. Mostly I was ignored. Some would come and say, is something troubling you, is something bothering you? And that really touched me. But then I started thinking, is something troubling me and bothering me? Because you see, the mind gets starts tripping over itself. 
that is what happens but words to reiterate are very powerful So that's a Sunday morning heavy uh, talk. Is it not heavy? Anyone would like to share anything? Then they are most welcome. Just, uh, I don't want to say, no, your, your, uh, actually, your talks are mainly about the silence only. Although you tell all these stories, but every time I come here, the central theme of the morning is always silence. You can feel it when you enter. I used to think it's because in your house, it's that meditation history. I used to feel, but I feel it here also. You always feel it. But that may be because of Asha Ji's Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but 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 the but the the side which is why if you whatever you say but the vibe is always of silence everybody can feel it you really made my life a bliss mm -hmm. i have a couple of questions answer yeah Little louder. Yeah. Yes, couple of questions. So, you know, uh, at one level, we are saying or we kind of know that uh, in Advaita that all there is is consciousness is being expressed. Well, I'm just taking a few examples which affect me. Like just yesterday, there was this cliffhanger match between Australia and New Zealand, which was just five. There's so many other matches like that. And somewhere it's like, the story is already done, it's in the can. And we are so excited about the match. And you know, the coaches are motivating the guys. Oh, already ho chuka hai. Matlab, jo hona hai, wo, we are going through something which is already done. Hmm. Sim and the connected thing is in the corporate world, you need desire and passion and motivation. And I was a motivational coach, which seems to be like I was living a lie. And uh, like go for it and you know you can't tell your boss that what will be will be because uh, it may be the truth yeah but, but he will say you got to go for it man just make it happen so how does one kind of uh, you know reconcile this that's one part of it and the other is that the ego is there matlab more as a an individual identity, but then can there be something like an Ugra ego and a Soumya ego where one is, like Ramesh used to say, one is like, I don't take delivery of the action while the other one is like, okay, I did it, I did it, and that's arrogance. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but the first thing, now my teacher loved cricket. Yeah. Like sometimes, you know, yeah. he would wait for the satsang to get over so he could go back to the <laughs> living room to switch the TV on. Yeah. So he enjoyed it. Right. Because that is being engaged in life. Okay. But the sage knows the outcome is predetermined. Okay. Doesn't mean he does not enjoy. In fact, he enjoys it even more. And the sage will not hesitate to clap for the other team if they do well. Mm. And the sage will not tell someone in the room, because of you, this wicket fell, please go out. Huh. We do that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Hilnamat. We do that. Yeah. You please leave the yeah. room. Or oh, Hilnamat. Don't, don't, don't shift. <laughs> Don't shift hilna matni to wicket giregi. Yeah. Or we want India to win. Yeah. So the sage yeah. 
will enjoy it even more than the ordinary person because the ordinary person will get depressed if their country loses. The sage will say, bring out my whiskey, the match is over. <laughs> I am ready for the next moment. And uh, you know, that example of Ramana Maharshi comes to mind. When his mother was passing away and he bestowed enlightenment on his mother through that process, and then someone called out or the bell rung after some time, signifying that lunch is ready. And he told everyone, lunch is ready. Mm. Onward to the next moment. Mm. So that is how the sage lives, you know. In the corporate world, I mean, Ramesh was the bank manager, right? He knew there were targets, targets goals, but he knew, he said, I always knew. That if I was to be promoted, it could only happen if it was God's will. He said, I already knew that even then. So I didn't strive beyond a point to push anything around, you know. And that is how he lived his life. So striving hmm. is going through the motions of... Yeah, are... and then blaming know, and condemning. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then saying, I was not good enough, therefore I didn't get the promotion. Maybe you didn't give it your hundred percent, but you were not meant to, otherwise you would have got it. So that dialogue for the sage stops there. He does not keep analyzing and interpreting it like we do. Because we are trying to hold someone or something accountable, you see. And the sage knows God is the one sole responsible being. He will not analyze it beyond a point. You know, the other day I was reading in fact, many people come to me with problems at their work and all that. I read in the newspapers a lady from Bihar, poor and uneducated lady. You know what she does? She, was, she had two choices. One is to beg on the streets. The other is to do work. She said someone took pity on her and said, come, I'll give you work to do. What was the work? Doctors had to perform post-mortems on dead bodies. And they needed someone to crack open the skull and cut open the body. And she said, I told this man, what the hell are you telling me to do? I am not even qualified for this. And he said, you don't need any qualification, the person is dead. You can crack open the skull the way you want, as long as you keep it open for us. And she said how she would tremble with fear and sleepless nights, but she knew this was where her money was going to come from. She had no choice. And she said today she has completed 20,000 such procedures. 20,000. And we complain if we don't get a promotion. Complaining is fine, then we blame and condemn. And then we say, I did more work than this person. I deserve it more. You've decided on your own. Because you feel you know best. That lady had no choice. And our challenges at work seem like a picnic compared to that. So it's so relative, you see. It's so relative. In my old office, there used to be this lift man. Mm -hmm. You know those, uh, the yeah. lift gates, yeah, opening, yeah, yeah, yeah. closing, opening, closing. And he looked so content. And he said, Saab, ye to mujhe achha lagta hai. Kyunki mein aap se, aap logon se milta hu. Yehi mera kaam hai. Pagar har mahina milta hai. And he died, an old man, died in the job of the lift man only, but content. We have a problem. So one last connected thing just here is that, you know, it seems like the root cause of you know, the bane is the ego, right? Because that's what makes us take, everything happens, starts from there. So that will also 
Can, will it ever fall off? And even if it falls off, it's for no fault of ours. It will happen when it happens or if it happens. So Ramesh would say the ego is not the problem. Okay. The sense of doership in the ego is the problem. You can walk as in Ikali. God's will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then God brings us thus far, right? Anyone who was feeling disheartened when they would talk to my teacher, he would say, look, did you decide to come here or did you read a book or heard someone and someone recommended? Some force made you come here. So why do you think God will drop you where you are? Don't be pessimistic about it. But it is easier to see life when one starts seeing from this perspective that nobody is the doer of their actions it becomes easier and easier to really understand this different dimension that people can't help doing what they are doing nor can i that seeing is all that is required you don't need a doing over that to undo the doing yeah. <laughs> it gets too much yeah yeah you see yeah. That is the problem with a lot of motivational and self-help talks <laughs> because they are giving you more and more to do yeah. and then that burden of doership becomes immense and this teaching is an undoing, it's an unraveling, it's a relaxation, take it easy. As it is, God has given you enough stress in life, we are not here to add more stress to that, we are here to <laughs> help release it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. In one, of, oh. in one of your lectures, you have mentioned about walking mind. In one of your lectures, you have mentioned about walking mind and thinking mind. These differ at the different uh, phases of life. Mind during childhood, during retirement, or during your active professional life. What is working mind and what is thinking mind? It depends if you are a working person, like a surgeon, which is the option, uh, an example my teacher would give. A surgeon has to conduct an operation. So the surgeon uses all his experience till that day to conduct the operation. He is in pure working mind mode, right? Working mind is there. Now, before the surgery, a colleague of his comes and tells him, hey, you better be careful. This is a celebrity. Kuch ho gaya to your yeah, profession is, is gone. <laughs> now, during the surgery, that thought comes. Are, are, I better be careful. Means his working mind got turned to thinking mind. Thinking about an imaginary situation which may or may not happen. But he is lost now. That connection with the work has got disrupted because the mind has started churning. So that is the thinking mind in operation. When I am with the task at hand, totally, then working mind. The classic example in spiritual scriptures is, if I look at a flower, in that split second I love it, what a flower. Then the mind starts coming, what is it called, what family does it belong to, which places does it grow in. So that story has started now being created and that that split second moment of pure joy looking at the flower has gone. During childhood, is it related to the concentration? Some children have good amount of concentration. So yes, in that sense, in their that working mind is fully engaged. So, But uh, the default conditioning now in this generation is one of fragmentation. Attention deficit syndrome is enormous. I mean, it's shocking because there's too much. There's too much and there's too much, especially social media, projection. I want to expose my story and who I am to people because now I have a platform. So I can say, look at me. In our days, it was much simpler. There was nobody who was going to look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Now you just post pictures of the best holidays, you know, I've been to Europe and here and there. You will not say I've been to Jabalpur because it doesn't enhance you. Now the projection is all out. Which phone I'm using, what clothes I'm wearing, 
So it's a very fragmented world and people are lost in the thinking mind. Uh, my so do you think it's eight, the knowledge which is the, a bliss or a cause? Too much of it. Too much of knowledge is a big problem. <laughs> because that can get stuck in the head. Whereas finally the teaching, the wisdom teachings rest in the heart. No, there should be the 50-50 <clears throat> of both. <laughs> <laughs> no. no my the sage, for the sage, the thinking mind is dead. The sage is either in the working mind or is resting in pure being. If the sage has to make an investment in the share market, the working mind will operate. The sage will decide based on his portfolio manager's advice, decisions will be taken. Then the sage rests because the sage knows thereafter, if the markets crash, if the stocks go up, whatever may be is the will of God. Whereas the ordinary person is checking it every two minutes on his mobile phone. Up, down, up, down, up, down and getting lost in that. So the sage working mind operates, decisions are taken and then it is left. The ordinary person thinking mind based on fear, what will happen if it goes down, this, that is mired in the story of life. So we have to work at developing that kind of mind. We have to understand that our thinking mind is what takes away our peace. Whereas if we accept it that there is a hand of God operating, all we can do is try. If I want to see my investments grow, I can try. That's all I can do. I can try and then leave it to God. Yes. That is where the sage rests in that knowing. So tomorrow if the markets crash or if his portfolio goes down, he may ask his manager, hey, what happened? But beyond that, he will not blame. Because he knows the market went down, his stocks went down because it was meant to go down. So there will be no hatred and malice for his manager or for himself. He won't beat himself up for taking the wrong decisions. He knows whatever he thought appropriate at that time, he made that decision. It so happened that God's will was different. Uh, my aim was asking about it was that I'm a pra practicing pediatrician and we keep on getting parents asking, just coming prior to exam, how to increase the concentration. They have done all the remaining things. Mm -hmm. So any particular extra thing we have to tell them? You know, I can tell you something little different. My teacher would tell parents, that the first thing is you have to understand that your child has come with their own destiny. Because when you try to force your child to perform, to, you know, work very hard, 100%, the intentions are noble. But the parents lose sight of this fact that every child has come with a set of attributes and has needs to be allowed to flower the way they are meant to and not straight jacket them into a system. The only thing here is, you may take away all the objects of distraction, yet one child's concentration ability will be more than the others because of the way they are innately built. But we try to bring them on an even keel, which according to me is a form of violence. And the genes play a lot of a role exactly. in this. The, not only the genes, Sanskars, you know, we come with different sanskars into this planet. A child may be not built for the academic structure the child is placed in and may suffer through it. But the child may be a very spontaneous child and develop an art form or something which is completely unbelievable. So, last question Can one develop EQ? By our efforts, can we develop child's EQ, emotional quotient, some, something similar? Yes, of course. And parents are doing that. But once again, once again, I feel that it has to be done without control. You know, we want to force the child to learn EQ, this, that. No, 
exposure and then let the child absorb what the child absorbs. Because there are many workshops going on, on EQ and all. So parents spend a lot of time after that. Yes. So they should be guided properly. That's what I thought. That is what I hope. <laughs> that is what I hope. We can make an attempt. Because now when the child is one year old, all the courses start. Anyway. Yes, yes. Really, in our time, it was not like that. Yeah. We were free that way. So Yes, sir. If a uh, lot of things are destined and, uh, and a prefix kind, then where does free will come? <laughs> <laughs> free will is the mechanism of daily living. We cannot avoid it. We have to take a decision every moment of the day. That is just the mechanism. But when we realize that our breath is not in our control, we are on planet Earth which is spinning at a certain velocity which is not in our control. We are here by means of gravity, not in our control. Blood is coursing through our veins, not in our control. Then we realize that the importance we gave free will, this, this overwhelming importance, now we are re-looking at it. Then we understand that I do have to take decisions, so it means I have to exercise my so-called free will. But my free will is based on two factors. One, my genetics. Two, my conditioning, which my parents created the environment, the economic environment, the religion, the school they sent me to, which made me who I am. Now, on the basis of my genetics and conditioning, which become my nature, I take a decision which is my free will. But now I know both these factors were not in my control. My genetics when I was born, no. My conditioning, no. So if the factors on which my free will depends on is not in my control, is it truly my free will? Yet I must exercise it. I have to decide whether to go for a holiday to Pondicherry or to Varanasi. I have to exercise my free will. But the sage, he also has to exercise his free will, but he will not try to force an outcome. The sage will know, all right, I didn't get tickets for Pondicherry. It doesn't mean I mope and feel sad. It was not meant to be. If I feel like going somewhere else, I go. So, Sage exercises his free will, but knows that it's not that valuable anymore. And he lives his life this way. That's Agreed. all. Agree with you. One more. God is finite or it's some infinite force or it's... God, God is, God is unknowable, you infinite, what Goldsmith would call the infinite invisible. Can't see it also. Finite how? Because we are in the world of form, then what happens? We take a Godhead figure like, let's say, Shirdi Sai Baba. He is our God. Because now we can relate to a form because we are in the world of form. So it's more relatable. But can God be reduced to one body-mind? But because it cannot be seen, heard, tasted, smelt or touched, that is God. But that's not our reality because we are lost in this reality of the senses. But when we are in deep sleep, we come closest to God. Because that God has given us that gift. That is why in the morning, no matter how rough the previous day was, we are so grateful for a few hours of deep sleep. Deep sleep, absolute silence. And Rajiv didn't exist in deep sleep. That is why it was silent. The problem is the Rajiv in the waking state. Because we have a story, which is creating this whole churn. So we are closest to God when there is a total absence of me. When there is an absence of me and my story and my goals, ambitions, opinions, judgments, values. That is my deep sleep. Everyone's experience. So, I am so thankful for my own absence. <laughs> it's crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely crazy.
everything you start seeing and your mantra will be when you see things happen. This is absolutely crazy. It's amazing. Now, can we worship that infinite invisible during the day? When we have this awareness behind us all the time, that there is a higher power which I can't see, hear, taste, smell and touch, which is running the show. I really don't know. I can use my intellect beyond a point I fail. Many things don't make sense to me anymore. When I stop making sense of life and just do what I feel I should do and leave it, then I'm living the enlightened life. Thank you. I also have two questions. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, suppose right. someone has apparently done so much wrong to you for no probable reason. This is your sounding like a journalist. Apparently, <laughs> no probable. <laughs> allegedly, someone allegedly that <laughs> brilliant. At least you're using these words. So, can you say that again? <laughs> Suppose someone has done wrong to you apparently. repeatedly for no probable reason. Yeah. So, isn't courage in this case standing up for yourself? Because if, the, if you don't stand up, the person will think it's okay to do wrong to you. If it is in your nature to stand up, by all means stand up. Because you are thinking that's what you should do and you do it. What if it's not your nature? What if someone is in a family where a parent or sibling is constantly doing wrong to them and this person is timid? Mm. This person may not be able to stand up. So you, this teaching will not tell you what to do and what not to do. This teaching will tell you, do precisely that which you think and feel you should do, but know this that that person is not the doer of his or her actions. Now you say what you have to say and do what you have to do. And my second question is, if everybody was born according to the way God made them, then how do people change? For, change because God makes them change. You see, God, as it is said in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, there are hundreds of thousands of people out of which very few are selected for the spiritual path. And out of those few, only one will know me by name. So what happens? Most of us live through our lives suffering unconsciously. And some people, this awareness is brought in. Hey, look here. There's, there's a dimension to life which you are being shown. You are now being woken up from the living dream of life. That is already decided by the higher power. But it may not be your friend's best friend's destiny. You may try your best to take him to a spiritual talk or whatever. He has no interest. That is not his path. But you are concerned with your path. Okay, thank you. Apparently, thank you. Or... <laughs> no, but it's great you are using these words because that means you're already measuring your view. It's really, I really appreciate it. Because it means you've already started seeing this in this light. But coming to this person who is troubling you, You will have to take a decision at some point. Are you willing to bear this or not? Do you have the option? So, now take a bad marriage. In India, it's a very classic case where the woman is dependent on the husband for finding. They have no choice. Now you have to see if someone is troubling you, what choices you have. I'm just mad at the professor who's doing that. <laughs> What choice do you have? <laughs> Pass the exam. Is there a method, methodology in standing? <laughs> or should you be defiant and impolite when doing it? Why is he troubling you? You're so sweet, yeah. <laughs> we had one, uh, Ananda will tell you, someone, a professor, my God. He gave us sleepless nights. And 
he used i mean many of us would tremble you know i still remember one of our school friends when the news came that he passed away he was jubilant fantastic this guy has gone so he was really a troublemaker not for one person but for many students in the class really i don't know if that is your equation with this professor but we would get sleepless nights then it is after years that i realized i thought about him and i said a man having so much malice towards children what must have been his childhood imagine you have your students hating you who would want that could he do that thing purposely and compassion arose now you are in a situation and if you feel you have to express yourself you must express yourself if that opportunity is there but when you come with this angle you will be objective you can tell him sir this is how i feel and if your environment allows you to express yourself to the professor you must do it but don't force an outcome don't go with this thing i am right you are wrong because there is no such dynamic operating you have to be open you have to be receptive and you have to express yourself thereafter what happens is in nobody's hands nobody's control you know these are what shape us when we have such experiences early in life when you are 10 years older you will look back and say that this is what shaped me someone being unfair someone picking on me because god is also exposing you to human nature how people can be we had some very benevolent teachers one was mrs chopra she was like a real mother to everyone everyone felt a motherly quality but then in this world of duality the flip side is always there waiting to be acknowledged everyone is not going to be motherly and sometimes i am given a hard lesson to wake up to this realization that i cannot expect the world to like me so it is hard while i am in it i may feel victimized i may feel at the receiving end and pain is bound to arise but i have to accept that pain and then do what i think and feel i should do now some parents when their child is not comfortable in a school environment are taking the child out of that environment in our generation it was unheard of you had to suffer your schooling otherwise you will get one slap it was not part of our conditioning here i see left right parents are pulling out children putting them in other schools it's it's a new age but someone so young as you has some interest in understanding what life is about why am i here why is this happening to me please please don't think that life is too hard on you otherwise god would have not brought you so far No, very often these professors have psychiatric problems of their own. Absolutely, <laughs> Rajiv. Yep, it's the same. It's the same with therapists. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh. I know because I get calls and emails from therapists because everyone is a human being. Yeah. You may be a very good therapist, but you have your own demons to deal with. Yes. So it could be a personality disorder, and yes, it is not or... necessarily you. That's what he is trying to say. Yeah. Unless you are very bad at the subject, I don't know. <laughs> Even then, it's not you. <laughs> so you can't cope with such people and yeah. you pass your exam and get to the next class.
it's like one uh, boy liked a girl and so to impress her he said i really love your personality she said don't worry i have many more samay <laughs> 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 Uh, is satisfaction absolute or relative? Relative. Relative. Peace so, of mind is absolute. Yeah. So um, when it comes to students, again. Are you also in the profession? Yeah. <laughs> so I heard a lot about professors today. <laughs> uh, actually, um, when it comes to students, when they are expected or when. when we tell them that okay you can perform better or we see a potential in them of course and when we want them to perform better then what they are doing some do perform after a certain help of course so there is a conflict in me always that whether i should tell them to be satisfied at a certain level of achievement or i should always tell them to strive for more this is a very good question so you have to do precisely what you feel that part is clear but you see the enlightened being will not push beyond a point where it's creating suffering for the child and creating a guilt complex that i am not good enough you know the the enlightened teacher the hope is to maximize the potential of the child but when there is that degree of awareness that i must not go beyond this threshold because it can create problems then because the understanding is i know that ultimately everyone will not perform at the same level people are gifted in different measure when that understanding is operating from behind automatically you will know where your limits are with each child and the intention is pure from the heart that i want to really maximize the potential but you will know when you are tipping over yeah so that means it is okay to talk about being content but at the same time means there is this conflict is always there that i am telling them in certain aspects of life that you be content this is something which is okay with you you are good in life you have a luxurious life you are sitting in this classroom some you are living somebody's dream hmm and at the same time i am telling them that you should strive for more you should do better or you should work hard in mo work hard to uh, of course. perform better of course so because you are like that the teachers like the third parent because you are seeing the potential in a child and wanting to guide the child on a path that is not the conflict the conflict is inside your own self because i am keeping on pointing back to this that you will know where your intention is coming from are you trying to bring them all up to one level or are you doing it on an individual basis maximizing the potential this is very important because in this role we tend to do factory farming you know we want the same output everywhere i ah, mean yes at upper level that is the expectation yeah which can be damaging for the child yeah that is my spot also i have noticed uh, from my interactions with my child uh, when uh, what is the difference in different teachers so a teacher who uh, cultivates a love for the subject then the child is never one never has to tell them do well in this subject because they just start loving the subject so much they and then sometimes it's the opposite where they did like the subject but because of this pushing they drop it yeah that happens too yeah so wherever the teacher is able to generate the joy of learning within the child then even the parent doesn't have to tell the child that do well yeah no sometimes it is like we talked about every individual has their own is coming with their own attributes mm -hmm. so they have their own um, set of uh, strengths and maybe in this setup a particular strength is not working for them or let's yes. put it this way ki in this setup they are not made to do the way they are expected to perform but because they are in this setup 
दे कैन नॉट बी टोल्ड दैट यू बी सैटिस्फाइड एंड यू डोंट वर्क इन अ पर्टिकुलर डायरेक्शन बट बट दिन टीचर अल्टीमेटली नोज एवरी चाइल्ड कम्स विद ओन डेस्टिनी Thank you. This was about husband and wife, father's relationship, marriage relationship, where the woman is being treated. See, even if it is a bad marriage, she is suffering. And if it is God's will, she will suffer. But should she not do anything about it? I mean, she is has it to a, try. She must try. and normally suffering makes us exercise options we wouldn't consider earlier some can be very violent options violent as in <laughs> kill the husband, <laughs> husband. need it be said <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the dilemma is that when we speak about god's will i equate it to destiny i think would it make me very complacent and just take life the way it is happening and stop me from doing anything actively to improve myself i mean that is one way of you know being no that is the ego going back through the back door because now it feels i can do something which means i can do the not being active since everything is god's will that's how it works it comes in through the back door okay but you can't because imagine you tell yourself today i won't go to the bathroom is it possible <laughs> you see you will be forced to go to the bathroom that's how it works so just to wrap this up I started by saying life is about relationships three kinds with others with yourself and with what happens in your life there's nothing outside of this everything is a relationship and when you start seeing that everyone in your life everyone is a piece on the chessboard of your life some are on the opposite side some are on your side some are pawns some are queens some are kings some are bishops some are knights and your chessboard of life is the black and white of duality the game of life is being played on the chessboard of life for and against me and the other but when we start living this life knowing that each piece is being moved by a hand above it and at the end of the game all the pieces go into the same box including your professor <laughs> when i can live this understanding in life i am at peace and that is when if i am lucky enough that god comes to take me away one day and stands in front of me and he asks me any last words and i find myself saying thank you thank you thank you to everyone those who loved me those who didn't love me and those who troubled me because i learned so much about life from all of you i learned how not to be i learned how to be and everyone has been my teacher my friends my colleagues at work my parents my siblings my children the stranger on the road the beggar on the street has taught me something and i'm grateful to all of you for this journey of learning and i say good night and goodbye to everyone that is all okay thank you thank, thank you, you.